So we've talked a lot about this being our 10th anniversary and how we invited some uh, special guests back, people who have a lot to the conference over the years. And our final closing keynote is someone who joined us in 2012 when his first book came out, Management, Management 3.0. Um, it was a resounding success, and we heard from you that you really enjoyed his talk. So we've invited him back, and the timing was perfect because his new book, Startup, Scale Up, Screw Up, was just released about a month ago. So anybody who got a copy while you were here today, that is hot off the presses. So please join me in welcoming Jurgen Apello. Okay. Thank you so much. Awesome. So it is amazing being here, seven years indeed after the first time I was in Columbus. I remember it well. I had amazing jambalaya somewhere up the, up the short north. I don't remember where. I'm going to try to find it again. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, this is, uh, this is actually the end of my uh, three-week whirlwind tour. I started in Chicago, and then I went all the way to San Francisco, and then all the way back to DC, and then up to Boston, and then down to Austin, and then to New York City, and now Columbus, and I feel so confused. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so dizzy. Um, just a warning, uh, I am Dutch, just so you know, okay? This is very important to realize. Some people point out, hey, you're so tall. Yes, yes, the Dutch are the tallest people in the world on average. That's because half of our country is below sea level. <laughs> the short ones are all dead. <laughs> and that's evolution. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, some people uh, pointed out to me, they were so nice to tell me that they had uh, read my earlier books. Management 3.0 was the first one that uh, appeared in 2011. I wrote a little one, How to Change the World as a Self-Publishing Experiment. You can get it for free. Just go to that URL, subscribe to my newsletter, download the book, and unsubscribe. Easy. <laughs> anyone, anyone can do that. Just that's a piece of cake. And, uh, and then the last one, Managing for Happiness, that I promoted to, to, uh, two years ago. But, uh, but first, something very important. And no matter where I go, usually around Europe, I like finding the best songs for me that have emerged out of that particular country. My, my, my favorite pop songs from that country. And I tried very hard with the US, but it was very, very difficult. Because basically, I don't like American music. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's me being dead. I will explain to you why in a moment, because there's a reason. But I found three songs that I liked very much, and, and they were from my youth, from my younger years. And this is, this is the, the first one, number three. You take yourself, you Remember take that one? Yourself, Laura Branigan. Laura Branigan, she sadly passed away in 2004, much too, much too early, and uh, Self Control was a big hit all over the world, and actually she stole it. It was an Italian song. It came from Europe. Maybe that's why I liked it. <laughs> and then uh, number two, one of my most favorite songs back then from the 80s. Yeah. I admit. <laughs> I admit. I was totally into Madonna. The first three albums, at, at, at least, I was, I, was, I was wearing Madonna T-shirts even. Uh, even to church, I, wa had, I was wearing Madonna T-shirts. I was, I was praying very hard not to be like a virgin for much longer. <laughs> Took a lot of praying, I can tell you. But then the number one, the best that has ever emerged out of the US. Here we go, there we go. Do it, stop. Doing what you're doing, don't stop. I love this. Divine. <laughs> I, have, I had all Divine's records. My father didn't get it. <laughs> he had no idea <laughs> what this was all about. <laughs> Three wonderful ladies from the US. <laughs> so um, yeah, as you, as, you, as you can understand, I, I am into bad music, OK? That the, the worse, the better. <laughs> and that's why the US scores, scores so badly, because Europeans are much better at bad music, I can tell you. There's so much to choose from over there on my continent. Anyways. So I start with that because of this uh, picture, an insight into how the music industry has changed over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. 
And uh, I am so old that I remember what happened before this slide, music cassettes and vinyl, uh, Sony Walkman on my side, about 13 songs on each side of the cassette, and then you had to take it out, turn it around, oops, tape got stuck, pinky finger, pinky finger. <laughs> Put it back in, <laughs> you remember that? So, uh, and then CDs became big, and uh, okay, a little bit of chauvinism here, Dutch invention, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. <laughs> I was proud of that. I was at uh, Philips in Eindhoven when they, they showed that in the first year. And then in 99, something happened and the revenues collapsed in the music industry. Anyone remember what happened in 1999? Napster happened, very good, yes. Now, some of the experts disagree on what actually was the effect of Napster on the music industry because they say those people weren't really buying CDs or records anyways, but you can see something happened for sure because <laughs> revenues collapsed. So uh, that led to a lot of change and then iTunes, legal downloads, and then uh, Spotify, Pandora, these are all those uh, streaming platforms. A lot of change in a, in, a, in a short amount of time, and we see that in many different industries. This is just an example. Just an example of what you can see in banking, in automotive, uh, etc. And it's no surprise that the, the executives, the management teams nowadays, uh, fear that they will be disrupted by those young ones, the startups, because they, they work on sustaining innovation. They made CDs better over time. But in the meantime, others come up with disruptive technologies like downloads that was something completely different and that actually started with worse quality songs, like you had to wait for an hour to download an album and then the, then the quality sucked or it was even the wrong one and things like that it was terrible. But it was about instant gratification of finding the music at that moment that you, that you wanted. And, and then the, 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 the startups, the disruptors basically overtake the incubants because they evolve faster. This is all described in the book, The Innovators Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. He says this plays out basically in, in many, many industries. And what executives want is they want it both. They want their cake and eat it uh, uh, at the same time. They want execution of a current business model, which requires a, a bit of order and control of that business model, a bit of hierarchy and centralization and efficiency, et cetera. But at the same time, they want disruption. They want new ideas. The future business models, that they also want that. And that means generalizing and, and networking and de, uh, decentralizing, both at the same time. Someone said to me, Jurgen, this is like the holy grail for coaches and consultants. If you, can, if you can explain to management teams how to organize themselves with their company so that they can have both, that's, uh, that's going to generate a lot of money. Well, I'm going to solve that innovator's dilemma today with you, I promise you. Yep, I'm hopefully going to make a lot of money, but we'll see about that. But uh, <laughs> I, know, I know it can be solved. The traditional approach is usually like this. The Innovation Steering Committee. <laughs> Anyone seen them before? <laughs> I was on a committee like that, like 15 years ago. We had the idea box uh, where employees submitted their suggestions. And then we, the wise people of the steering committee, looked in the idea box and we looked at every idea. And we said, well, this doesn't make sense. <whistles> we have no money for this. <whistles> this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> and then, oops, the box was empty. <laughs> we rejected everything. And of course, the, the, the stream of new ideas dried up because why bother sending anything to the, to the innovation committee because they reject everything. This is, I think, a modern innovation steering committee because at least they have sticky notes on the window. You can see that. <laughs> a steering committee 2.0, perhaps. <laughs> but still not how it is supposed to be. And um, the, the problem is a little bit, and I also recognize that in the Agile community with Scrum and, and Kanban boards, whenever there's an Agile coach involved somewhere with a the workflow, they, they create a Kanban board. Okay, well, let's, let's Kanban or Scrum the hell out of this, this workflow. And put up a board and, and columns and stickies and everything moves from the left to the right. Well. Um, not everything is a pipeline, because the assumption here is that your work is a pipeline. When you put it on one end, it has to come out on the other. And that is also the assumption that we had as the innovation committee. Once we committed to an idea, 
then it would go on to the innovation Kanban board and it has to come out on the other end, like a digestive system of innovation. Right? What goes in on one hand, it has to come out on the other and it won't will not look pretty when it comes out <laughs> on the other end of that, of that pipeline. So as an example, there are other workflows that can, that can work quite well. Anyone knows what this is? You can't read it, that's the point. <laughs> Care to guess? It, it's a flight checklist. It's a flight checklist. So it has uh, startup, taxi, before takeoff, takeoff, climb, et cetera, et cetera, and then lots of checks. Check, 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 check. That's the workflow that has emerged as a good practice in, in the airline industry. That's why I arrived here safely this, uh, this morning, because they have these practices. Now, I sometimes jokingly say, when you, when you would have an agile coach trying to coach pilots, they will plaster the windows of the airplane full of stickies and have stuff move from the left to the right. And OK, we'll need, we need a takeoff column, and we need a, we need a climb column. We'll get those windshield wipers away here. So yeah, that doesn't work that well. They have another, they have another best practice. And, uh, and this one as well, the sales and marketing funnel. Uh, there's a wonderful practice called the, the pirate metrics, the R metrics, <laughs> that uh, sales and marketers and growth hackers use to optimize the various stages of, uh, of the funnel. You can optimize the, the acquisition step. You can optimize the, re excuse me, the retention step, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is not a pipeline. <laughs> and there are other workflows, such as hiring, recruitment, by definition, is not a pipeline. The whole point is that you end up with one best candidate out of the 100 or so that, that apply. Right? So not everything is a pipeline. And the same applies to innovation. Now, I find this so important that I have it in red. And I want you to say this with me as a takeaway so that you'll remember it, OK? So at the time of three, at the count of three, everyone's going to say some workflows are funnels, not pipelines. Okay? So here we go. One, two, three. Some workflows are funnels, not pipelines. Amazing. I love this audience. This is going very well. We're going to do this two more times. So those are the, I will have three very important takeaways during this, uh, this talk. So uh, that's an insight, not a, not a funnel, sorry, not a pipeline, but an, a funnel innovation. I'll get back to that at the end, because it's crucial. Um, so this assumption that everything is a pipeline leads to bureaucracy, a lot of, lot of project initiation documents or, or whatever we find around the world, just trying to predict everything that might go wrong with the project. And, uh, and, and we need to get rid of all that bureaucracy. And of course, Agile and Lean help us at the, at the team level to get rid of all those stupid rules and everything. And I'm sure some of you recognize some of these pictures, agile frameworks and models, a safe and less and dad and X scale and holacracy and Spotify model, and you name it. Lots of people have great ideas. But as far as I know, none of them have yet solved the innovator's dilemma which is the thing that executives struggle with. How do we execute our current products and services and innovate with disruptive new stuff at the same time in the company? Well, what I did was I looked at the actual disruptors. I went around Europe, because there are already so many books about American companies. There's already so much good stuff, good stories from the US. Uh, I thought, I'm going to write a book and use European examples. And uh, so I was at Spotify in Stockholm. I was at Flixbus. I see them uh, driving around here in the US now as well. They're a German company from Berlin. I was there. Um, I was at um, Rovio in Helsinki, famous for Angry Birds. Um, Booking.com, anyone heard of them? I hear stories about Airbnb all the time, one book after another. Well, Booking.com is five times larger, and they're Dutch. So there you go. Uh-huh, yes, very important to know. And uh, I interviewed CIOs and agile coaches and lots of people. And you know what? None of them mentioned an agile, screaming, uh, agile scaling for framework. Yeah. I, heard I heard the Spotify model mentioned once at a company called Spotify. <laughs> In a sentence, even we don't use the Spotify model, <laughs> which was fascinating. <laughs> So uh, yeah, my friend Marcin Florian uh, told me about that. 
So what do they do? Well, uh, they think in terms of startups and scale-ups and life cycle stages. That is what I recognize all the time. And I'm going to lead you through the stages that we find uh, all the time across the world. Stage number one is initi uh, initiation. Someone has a great idea. <laughs> iPod, a thousand songs in your pocket. That was a great idea, because I had just 25 songs in my pocket. And Steve Jobs said, I could have 1,000. That was, whoa, <laughs> I would love that. Now we have a billion songs in our pocket, and we're like, Hurgh. it doesn't have my favorite songs. <laughs> but back then, 1,000 was, uh, whoa, that's, uh, that's amazing. So uh, a thousand songs in your pocket, a product vision, someone has an idea, the, the, the cliche light bulb moment or under the shower moment or, or whatever. That's usually where it starts. And then stage two should be expedition, the first experimentation of seeking problem solution fit, as they call it in startup language. Is the thing that you have on your mind, is that actually solving someone's problem? You gotta test this. And it is amazing that actually quite a few of startup founders, both in companies and independent startups, skip this step. I think this has been one of the major problems in the whole blockchain cryptocurrency world out there, where we had technical people falling in love with a new technological idea, and then they started coding right away without validating whether the idea that they had was actually solving someone's problem. And quite often, actually, it didn't. So what do you do in this stage? Run tests. You actually do not make a product. You just fake it. Kickstarter is full of these tests, full of products that do not exist yet, but just a video, just a landing page for you to sign up. And then based on how many people sign up, they measure how much interest there actually is for this product. If there's not enough interest, yay, we learned something. We don't even have to start building the product. Well, that saves us a lot of time. <laughs> we can try and do something else. So that's the whole point of stage two, is making sure that it is worth starting in the first place. And we call it in Lean Startup language the minimal viable product of the low fidelity type. You don't even build the product. You're just faking it. Then suppose you have tested it. People are interested, they sign up, your Kickstarter project is a success, the money is coming in. Uh, stage three is making sure that you actually have enough resources, both money and uh, uh, people, co-founders, to, uh, to, uh, to build the product. Commitment to pursue the idea. Vision founders fit is a term that I sometimes heard in the, in the startup world. Uh, do you have a team that can actually pull this off and, and do they have enough financial backing? And that, could be like maybe a week for an internal startup idea. Just arrange the right colleagues and, and, and get a budget from a manager. This could be maybe half a year for an external startup that have to hold up their hands with angel investors or whatever. So that can uh, be quite a bit of a difference. But everyone has to have a team and has to have some funding. I have, a, I have a couple of uh, small companies that I'm involved in. One of them, uh, 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 the most recent one, is uh, it's called Agility Scales. And there are ten, 10 people in very different countries. Two in the US, uh, California, the rest in Europe, all over uh, Europe. And uh, one thing we had to figure out in this stage was how do we work together? How do we form a team? The team building part is essential to figure out in this stage, because we need to come up with something successful fast. So one practice that we came up is uh, the daily cafe. The daily cafe is we join uh, on Zoom, that's the technology that we use for our video calls, every day at five Central European time for anything that there is to discuss. Very much in a lean coffee kind of style. We just type the topics in the chat window and we go through them one by one. Doesn't take more than maybe 20 minutes on, on average. But it's just that you know that there's always a next daily cafe within 24 hours. So some things are better postponed until we have a face-to-face -face chat, because that will be easier than typing everything on, uh, on Slack. One thing that we noticed is it is important with virtual teams to do some team building and to have some deliberate rituals for that. So for example, the first five minutes of our daily cafe are mandatory chit-chat. We must talk not about work. 
So, um, what do you think of the ending of Game of Thrones? <laughs> or uh, how about uh, Brexit? Uh, is she going to pull it off this time? Is it going to be the fourth attempt? <laughs> well, whenever we discuss politics, it can, be, it can become 15 minute chit chat, I can tell you. But uh, yeah, always, uh, is, your, is your wife back from the hospital? Anything, anything is allowed, as long as it's not about work. And it's very helpful, because it helps us to get to know each other a bit. So that's all Vision Founders Fit. Another thing you can start in this stage is work on your Lean Canvas, which is a popular tool among startuppers. It's basically a visualization of your business model where you try to explain to yourself what is the problem, what is the solution, what is the unique value proposition of us for our customers. I will come back to that a bit later in this, uh, in this talk uh, during the Innovation Vortex. But this is the... Uh, this is the, 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 the point where you can start discussing that with your team. You have to cap, come up with a business model that works. Now stage four. According to some, this could be the most difficult stage. This is product market fit. Can you now, with your team, make something that people love, that they sign up for, that they keep using? Because they might buy into your vision, but if they don't actually use your product, then you're still failing, right? So product market fit is super, super important. And there, again, you have minimal viable products, but then of the high fidelity type. You actually build a product, but then as iteratively as possible. And that is not something I need to explain to this audience, I'm pretty sure, to do this in, in rapid, rapid iterations. By the way, I heard a fascinating uh, anecdote about, uh, about the iPod, which is the, the first version you see here on this picture. I do not have pictures of the prototype versions uh, that were developed in the product market fit stage that, of course, were only shown to Steve Jobs because he represented the customers. He knew pretty well what, what, what clients would, uh, would love. And when the product team came to him with the, the next prototype, he said, no, nope, it's still too big. And the product team said, but, but we cannot make it any thinner. They knew how important that was to him. But we did everything we could. We can't make it thinner. He said, you're certain about that? I don't believe it. So he walked with the prototype to an aquarium. And he dropped the prototype in the aquarium. And then bubbles emerged from it. And he said, look at that. Air is coming out. Remove it. They had to come back with something that doesn't even contain air anymore. That was so fascinating. And now you have the iPod Air, and this is amazing. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that's uh, yeah, that's iteration that they did with Apple on the in, on the inside. And during product market fit, you will probably have to pivot and persevere. That's the famous terms you will find in, in lean startup language. You have to figure out whether or not the direction you're going is still the correct correct road to take. Maybe at some point you need to say, we need to take another, another road. Uh, and uh, pivoting is, is a change of strategy without changing, of your, changing your vision. You still have the same vision of the problem that you want to solve, but you're going to take an entirely different strategy to get there. Persevering is just doing whatever you do, and you validate one single thing at a time. You just go ahead. This is going fine. I personally have a feeling that there's a category in between. Like uh, pivoting would be moving out of your house, uh, going to another city, and, and, and um, uh, because a new house would satisfy your goal in life or something, and you start, uh, you reboot your life somewhere, somewhere else. So it's a very significant change. You don't do that very often. While persevering would be replacing the curtains in your house or something like that. A very simple, simple improvement. But there's this category in between, like a new kitchen. Oh, my God. <laughs> there's these significant changes that you don't want too often, but they happen more often than moving out of your house. So I think there's a category. I call them patches. We had quite a few patches with my team, but not really a pivot uh, so far. So that is product market fit stage. Hopefully, you validate that people love your product. Now, suppose that they're signing up and that they refer it to their friends and they're, they're slamming on your door. Give me the next version. I love it. Is this now the moment for you to scale up with the idea? No. The number one reason why startups fail is that they scale up too soon, as I heard many, many times. I read it. The investors told me. 
because you're often not ready yet when you have product market fit. You do not yet have business market fit. The rest of the business needs to be ready for it. You don't take off when the plane is still half finished, right? Because that's going to be very, very dangerous. So one thing, for example, is if you did everything well, lean startup mode with minimal viable products, then you faked everything in the back end. There's a lot of stuff broken and, and manual, and it doesn't integrate well, et cetera, et cetera, that you'll have to work on. The people on the front end, the customers, the user, they love the product, but they don't see that the financial system the, the, uh, is, is, is a, a complete disaster, and, uh, and that you have huge technical debt that you have to reduce first, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, that, the, cus uh, that the, uh, the content management system is called the Paula and Jada, like in our case was for, uh, for two years, because yeah, they just did all the content management. The users didn't see that. So fix that first. One, another reason one investor told me, uh, she said, um, when you switch from startup to scale up, you're going to also switch to a different audience, because you had innovators and early adopters in the early stages. And they are in it for the vision. They love what you're doing, and they want to help you out. And when they find a bug, they are proud to report it to you. They're the first ones to find that bug. But when you move to the early, adopt, uh, sorry, the early majority, they don't, they don't want to be the first ones to find a bug. They don't want to find bugs. If they find one, they will not report it to you. They will report it to their friends on Facebook. Right? That's like I would do often, yeah because I would be an early majority kind of person, not, an, not the innovator. So you have to prepare for that and, and fix everything. You, this is also probably the moment to switch from your lean canvas back to the business model canvas, which is the original version by Alex uh, Osterwalder, uh, which is basically the, the version for the adult businesses. Right? Because now you have to also talk about what kind of customer relationships do I want, in startup mode, everything is probably face to face with your customers because you, 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 ha you hardly have any. So you can do that face to face. But now you're going to scale up. You need to talk about what kind of relationships do we want. The key partnerships, the key channels are important now. In startup mode, no channel is interested in your product because it doesn't work yet. But now it is interesting to start talking about that. So you switch to the business model canvas. Another thing to be doing from this stage is when you scale up, it means that other people will be hiring other people. That means that your culture has to be codified from this point. You could do everything, everything personally and, and intuitively up to now as a founder, as a, as a co-founder team. But uh, from this moment on, you're scaling up and you have others hiring others, so now you have to make sure that everyone has the same core values. You might want to produce a culture code or something, put it up there on, uh, on a website, things like, things like that. OK, final stages of the business life cycle. Acceleration is rapidly scaling up. Now something works. You want it 1,000 times bigger. Growth hacking is all the rage in the startup scale-up world. That basically means a product that works, tweak it endlessly in the way the features work, the messaging around it, etc. Should the button go left or right? Should the font be bigger or smaller, red or yellow or whatever? Anything that you can change to increase conversion rates. But what I had to learn was that this only works for products that work in the first place. You cannot multiply by 1,000 something that is zero it will still be zero, yeah, basic math. But I had to learn that as a founder because I sent my team to a growth hacking course, but we were still in product market fit. That was stupid. We were in stage four. We were not ready for scaling up. So my team members learned things that were completely unusable for us because we're not uh, ready to do all those techniques yet. That was a, a bit uh, dumb uh, in hindsight. Stage seven, crystallization, you cornered the market, now you are the one ruling this particular industry. Stage eight, ooh, midlife crisis. Ooh, what do we do to stay relevant? When a product appears in 16 colors, you know the end is in sight, basically. <laughs> you know they ran out of ideas. <laughs> what else can we do? Oh, let's make a blue version. <laughs> Maybe people will buy that. Stage nine is conservation. The product is just costing you money right now. People are walking away, but it's too early to turn off the lights. 
Uh, we, we keep the senior citizens around for a little longer in, in our product uh, portfolio. <laughs> Uh, and the stage 10 is, okay, let's just admit the product is dying, the service is dying, and we prepare for that. We make it a project, offboarding everyone, and then closure of this business model. No. Now, I have that as a, a, a workshop exercise. I do new workshops based on, on this book, and have people uh, express with sticky notes typical behaviors, not only of human beings that change over our life cycle stages, but also of business models, of the kind of behavior that team members have or should have depending on where their product or service is in the business model life cycle. Super fascinating uh, exercise. You can see how that uh, plays out or has played out for the iPod. Uh, you see here a picture. Uh, it stays one to four are off screen because of course the iteration with the MVPs and prototypes that was done all internally, nobody was allowed to know about it. Then stage five, six rapid scaling. Seven, uh, we cornered the market. Eight, oh my God, what do we now what do we now? Oh, let's make a blue version and pink version, etc. Nine, ten, dead. It's over. Anyone still using iPods? Nobody. A couple of people. All right, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, no support anymore <laughs> from Apple. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, because Apple has moved on as a company. They know this. They know that products and services start up, scale up, and screw up. This is the normal life cycle of any, any business model. The th interesting thing is that at the top of this curve, the iPod contributed 40% to Apple's income, 40%. Does anyone know how much the iPhone as a business model now contributes to Apple's income? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So between 60 and 70%, much more than the iPod did back then. And in which stage is the iPhone? Stage eight, midlife crisis. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's what everyone agrees on. <laughs> more features. How can we stay relevant? Is it blue? It's blue. Uh huh. Yep, evidence. <laughs> so, uh, so I call this the business life cycle. The 10 stages uh, of, of business model, they're perfectly normal. This can, the, these life cycle stages, they can happen in a matter of maybe half a year for a, for a game on the App Store, right? It is over very quickly, and then the company has to come up with a new game. The games industry works like that, game after game after game, endless evolution. For other industries like insurance, oh, maybe this could take two centuries for a business model to emerge and grow. No, that's, that's perfectly normal. That's, it, it can take a very long time. Like with, with species and organisms, I will get back to that at the, at the end. It's a great metaphor. Some, some animals live just a couple of months and then they're dead. Others, they, they live for decades and then they're dead. But the same principles apply. They will die. All products and services will die. And the point is, as I said in the beginning, it's an innovation funnel. They all start at stage one, but stage by stage, fewer and fewer remain. That is the whole idea of what an innovation committee should be doing. Here's another metaphor. Come on! Upside, inside out. She's living la vida loca. She'll push and pull you down. It sounded like two three-year-olds who've got flu trying to sing. I love his insults. He's much better at it than I am. <laughs> so for me, is, this is Innovation Steering Committee 3.0. <laughs> they let everyone start. <laughs> everyone can begin in the contest. Yeah, yeah. They just create the game rules of the ecosystem, and then stage by stage, more and more drop out. And by the end, you get to the last stage, only a few candidates are, uh, are remaining. And they judge those candidates, those performers, based on, on evidence. What can you actually do? Show me the evidence that it is working. Same with startup ideas. Show me problem solution fit. Show me product market fit. Show me business market fit, etc. And then you will get funded. That is how Silicon Valley works. That's how every startup ecosystem works, basically. You have to show the evidence to the investors. Otherwise, they don't let you through to the next stage, and you die. That is very, very normal. Now, what I learned is that the rules should change depending on life cycle stage. And that is something that is very hard for big organizations to get. 
My brother, this is a picture from when we were young. I, you recognize the, the sexy pants here? They're very popular nowadays. I started the whole trend back then, when I was 10, as you can see. And um, <laughs> my, my little brother, Jeroen, oh, was a little rascal. You could see on his face that he was already planning something new, devious. Back, uh, back then. He thought, it was, he thought it was unfair that I was allowed to come home anytime I wanted, while he had to be home at 7 o'clock each night. That was so unfair. Well, first of all, my mother said, Jürgen is in, a different, is in the next life cycle stage. Different rules apply. Maybe when you're three years older, you have, have the same rules. And second, um, I will think about it if at least for a year I don't have to pick you up from the police station. Oh, I love my brother. He's such a sweet guy. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we, I, I think we also have to apply that kind of thinking to the products and services that we are developing. I'll give you an example. OKRs, objectives and key results, all the rage nowadays. There's not an agile conference where I do not hear someone say objectives and key results. Super, super fascinating. I love the concepts. Basically, uh, people set targets for themselves in a transparent way and then publish to the whole company how they have or have not been able to achieve those targets. I love the, uh, uh, I love the mindset behind it. But people keep telling me that it can take at least a year for this to get up and running in, an, in a large organization. I said it's quite complicated uh, and, and everything. Now, in the startup world, nobody talks about OKRs. They all talk about the North Star metric which is a much simpler, much more reduced goal-setting framework. The one metric that binds them all. There's one thing that we focus on as a self-organizing team, and that is what we're going to optimize in the next few months. And it could change every now and then, like with OKRs, but it's just one thing. We don't make it complicated, keep it simple. And preferably, this should be a customer-facing North Star metric, so, for example, Spotify could have as a North Star metric the minutes of music per user per month consumed on the platform. That makes sense, because the more I listen to Spotify, the more you can assume that I love that service. So that's a reasonable proxy for value. Same with Netflix, the amount of minutes of video that I watched. Though sometimes, if you Google for North Star metrics, you'll find other examples, such as daily active users or monthly recurring revenue. And I thought originally, that's, that's ridiculous, because those are not customer-facing metrics. As a Netflix user, I don't care how many other users there are on Netflix. I just want them to have my favorite series. I want a big library. So that's not important for me, the number of users. But then I thought, OK, but uh, maybe the business, the startup is in a stage where the investors are the most important customers at that point. You need to get funded before you can even start building your minimal viable products. And investors want to see other numbers, like how big is the network? How many users have you been able to acquire? OK, so then it's fine to focus on that for a couple of months, and then take their money, and then move to another North Star metric, and have it customer focused from that point, once you have your bank account filled with, uh, with the funding budgets. So that makes, makes sense. Now, the point is, maybe in the early stages, we should do North Star metric, and maybe in the later stages, we could do OKRs. Like the rules for my brother and me differ, depending on the life cycle stage. Is anyone aware that, that Ken Beck now goes around with his 3X framework and saying, well, I, I've reconsidered the whole uh, TDD thing, like, OK, it makes sense to do test-driven development when you have an adult product or service. But when you're still a kid, there's a 9 out of 10 chance that you don't even make it to the next stage. So why bother about technical debt? You, what you need to reduce is the risk of building the build, wrong product in the first place. So focus all your attention there. That's the first X. And the second X is, OK, we have product market fit. Now stabilize it. Reduce technical debt so that we can go into the next stage. That's the same, same conclusion, basically. The rules depend on life cycle stage. So, I think this is so important that we're going to reiterate this. At the count of three, you will repeat after me the sentence on this screen, OK? Here we go. One, two, three. Different ages need different practices. I love you guys and girls. Awesome. That's so amazing. 
so cooperative, I like that. Uh, I have one more near the end, I'll promise you, a very important one, maybe the most important one. But first, this was the first part of solving the innovator's dilemma. I said, I'm going to solve the innovator's dilemma, dilemma today with the life cycle stages of an idea, basically, of an innovative idea. Next part is the innovation vortex, and it starts with this picture, the design thinking process, popularized by the Stanford uh, University, uh, and uh, uh, it is, uh, I love design thinking, uh, about empathizing with users, etc. but there's one thing that I hate, which is this particular picture. Anyone care to guess why I hate this picture? Yes, indeed, thank you so much. It looks linear. It looks linear, like step by step, five steps and then we're done. And it is the same for this one, the design thinking uh, process by the Design Council in the UK. They have four different words, but they comes down to the same thing, four steps. Same with this one, design sprint process. Again, five different words, uh, design thinking on steroid, basically in one, in one week. Five days, five things, different things to do. They're all sequential. They don't mean it. If you read design thinking literature, if you talk with the experts, they emphasize again and again, it should be circular. We have to do this iteratively, like we know in the agile community. But then I look at the pictures that they create and I see all linear pictures and I think, we know in the agile world, if you show things as a linear sequence, that people are going to interpret this as a waterfall process. Your designers, duh. <laughs> You should come up with a better picture. This should not be that hard. Now the lean startup movement has a better picture, I think, it is circular. Oh, thank God. <laughs> a circle, <laughs> something iterative. Build, measure, learn. There's just one thing that annoys me about this. It, does, it says, build, measure, learn. Build what? Does it come falling out of the sky, the ideas that we're going to build and measure and learn from? No, there's a lot that we need to do. Well, actually, the, 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 the Lean Startup experts say, you should get out of the building. Don't sit at you, behind your desk in the office. Talk with people and look at what they're doing. But the picture doesn't say it. It just shows half of the story. So that's why I don't like that either. So what I did, and I'm really good at that, I'm just using models that already exist. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, and I just grab one rung higher on the, on the ladder. I mix them, I match them, and I came to one conclusion, is that there's one thing missing, which is the, what design thinkers call framing. I call it context, which is when you empathize with a person, you already made the decision, which person to empathize with. There are seven billion people on the planet. We cannot empathize with everyone. We'll have to make a decision somehow what to focus on as, uh, as a business with our idea. And then the others, I mapped them onto each other. As you can see, Lean Startup at the end, they make a distinction between measure and learn. I like that. It is implied in the other three models where they have it under one word, test, deliver, validate. So uh, I came up with a different picture. I made a circular. That's very important. And I looked at synonyms for the word circle because I don't like the word circle. It's boring. And I came up with vortex and thought, yes. That's it. <laughs> a vortex that sounds like tornado, whirlwind, something active, something that is dynamic instead of a stupid, boring, static picture. So vortex it is. And it's not about agile or lean or design or development. It's about innovation. That's what we're, we're talking about here. So the innovation vortex, just my new picture for Lean Startup and Design Thinking uh, uh, combined. And because I like colors, I made it colorful. Very important to have colors, as you can see. Yeah. And uh, I will give you some examples. Some examples. Innovation thesis. That is a, a practice that uh, uh, st um, accelerators and incubators, those who support startups, that they often use to, to frame, to contextualize the kinds of ideas that they want to invest in. We do biotech. We do AI. We do blockchain, whatever. They have a certain focus on the world based on what they believe is going to happen, going to be important, and that's the kind of ideas they invest in. A company should do the same thing, come up with an innovation thesis, uh, and then ignore all the rest. X Factor, Voice of America, and all those TV shows do the same thing. They have an idea of the kind of candidates that they will admit to the contest, and then everyone else cannot participate. 
So where does that sit? Well, contextualize, framing, right? That's reducing the size of the area that we're going to look at. Another example, empathy maps. Very popular practice. Uh, I, I took a picture a couple of weeks ago of an empty, empathy map that I made with my team about our, uh, uh, our users. We just collect all the information, everything that we learned in a very divergent mode, everything, everything we have, just fling it onto the wall and then categorize it a little bit. Who, what are they thinking and uh, what are they saying, those customers and users, to understand uh, uh, them a little bit better. Where does this practice fit? Well, definitely empathizing, discovering their needs. Also, bit a first step into synthesizing, defining, like categorizing a little bit, but still very much divergent. And we can narrow further down with the next two practices. Uh, the lean persona, for example. Now we know everything about our potential user or customer. Let's give that person a name, a fictitious name and some fictitious other demographics and, and, and tasks and behaviors so that we can talk about that person. My team has two lean personas, Patricia, the internal scrum master, and Alberto, the external agile coach. And we always talk about Patricia and Alberto. It's like they are, they are our friends by now. <laughs> As always, well, Patricia's going to love this, but Alberto, mm, he, will, he will not care. They don't exist. But we know many people like Alberto and Patricia, and that makes it easier for us to, to connect uh, uh, with them. And then we need to understand what is their job to be done? What is the actual thing that they are trying to achieve? I have a picture of coffee here because those who follow me on Facebook know that I like coffee. Uh, so for example, when I'm in a strange city and I am in need of coffee three times per day, I type coffee on my smartphone, uh, sort by distance, open now, and then I start, <clears throat> start walking. And the, the coffee bars that emerge, that I, that I arrive at, they should not just have decent coffee, but also nice chairs, good Wi-Fi, just a nice ambience to do my work for one or two hours, because I'm a traveling person. I don't have an office. I work from anywhere. So that is the job to be done that the cafe needs to achieve for me. I don't, the, the best coffee in the world is useless if there's standing room only. Then I'm not going to sit there and not buy the coffee either. So where does that, does that sit? Uh, well, that is the synthesized part, right? That's defining what is the problem that we need to solve. And the next one, next example, is the, the value proposition canvas. I mentioned the word earlier, the un unique value proposition. You have on the one hand your idea. This is what we think is important in the world. On the other hand, our lean persona and job to be done. This is what we have identified, defined. Now, what ideas can we come up with to connect the two? What are the pains that we need to solve with the pain relief? Or what are the gains that they will be interesting for them with, offered with gain creation? Pains are usually more effective. I often give the example of my, my, my smart watch, uh, my Garmin watch. I switched to this because I dropped my phone three times while running. That was rather expensive, I can tell you. So then I thought, OK, well, let's switch to a, uh, to a, to a smartwatch. And, and, and that was a pain that I solved with, with that switch to a new product. And then I discovered, oh, it can measure my heart rate and other cool, fancy stuff. But that was not the reason why I switched. The gains were not what pulled me to the new product. The pain relief uh, did. So that all sits in, in, in synthesize and then hypothesize, of course, the ideation. What kind of ideas can we come up with? That's the next stream of the vortex. And then the lean experiment uh, template. There are a couple of templates that you can find. I made a new one because I thought some were too simple and others were too complicated. So this is a bit of a, a, bit of a mix. You, come, you have to come up with hypotheses, as I did just now. But this could be an interesting idea, but then you need to test it. Uh, and you start with the riskiest assumptions. You have to reduce the risk as fast as possible before you commit to anything that's going to cost you a lot of money. For example, if you think a new coffee bar in a certain street is going, it will be an amazing idea, well, before you sign up and lease a, a, a space, that you're stuck with for the next year, um, a very, that will be a very risky assumption. 
you might want to start with just a trolley and, and do a simple test and, and just sell coffee in the street there for a day and then measure how many coffees you can sell. Is, is there any throughput actually in, in the street? Do people come by and are they interested in coffee at what times of the day? I know some some of those small carts have run tests like that. There was one in Brussels where they stood in various streets just to measure where it was the best place <laughs> to, to, to stand. And they found a corner near a university and that's where they ended up. Uh, uh, that was the most uh, coffees they sold, sold there. So that was testing that they did. And you can use a, a lean uh, experiment template uh, for that. So, and that covers basically the hypothesis, the building, the testing, and the learning from it. There's four streams of the vortex, all in one, with a lean, a lean experiment. But then the final two examples, the, the most fun ones, in my, in my opinion. So I have this new book. Some of you have seen it before. Uh, I signed a, copy, a couple of copies just now. Um, I, uh, I, am, I have a startup and my publisher asked me for a new book after the success of the previous one. Well, that's a nice compliment, of course. But I said uh, um, that I need it to be about startups because that's the thing that I'm doing now and there's no better way to learn something than to write a book about it. That's what all authors know. Just write about it and then you'll, you'll be one step ahead of your readers, uh, basically. So uh, that was one thing, and I said, uh, scaling is all the rage in the agile community, so startups scale up. And then immediately screw up came to my mind. Oh, we love talking about failure. That's, that's not, a, not an issue in the agile community. Startups scale up, screw up. All right, the publisher said, that's a great idea. But um, I got a word back from my publisher in New York. They said, it ends with a bad word. I said, I don't see a bad word. I just see screw up. What's bad about it? Well, they said, um, if it ends with screw up, then maybe the, the readers are going to think that you promise them that you will screw up their, their business. I, I, I said, I think my readers are smarter than that. I mean, seriously. <laughs> Who would write a book like that? Uh, yeah, well, we believe that this is going to hurt sales. I said, in God we can believe everyone else brings evidence. Where is your data? about your gut feeling. Well, we don't have any. And can you please change the title into Startup, Screw Up, Scale Up? I said, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> I said, you're born, you grow up, you die. What's the problem? That's the normal life cycle. It's the message in the book. That, that makes no sense to change the, to change the order of the words. So uh, well, what I did was uh, I, thought, I said, I'm going to run a test. I have 10,000 people on the mailing list. That's all those people who were dumb enough they could not find the unsubscribe button, basically. <laughs> I sent them a test, and uh, I asked them to rate the book cover. Just click on it and give it a rating how much you like it. Give me some feedback. What they didn't realize, that they were part of another test, because I sent 5,000 people one version, my preferred title, and the other 5,000 I sent the title as preferred by the publisher. Startup, screw up, scale up, which makes no sense whatsoever, in my opinion. You know. But I thought, I want to be sure about this. And I had an hypothesis. I thought, maybe this is a cultural thing. Maybe this is different in North America versus Europe, where I am from. Let's test it. <laughs> So I split the audience again in two other uh, 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 sections. And what do you know? Both of us were right. <laughs> Indeed, I could see in the data that in North America, there's a small percentage point difference, not much, but a small percentage point difference. People preferred startup screw up, scale up, or screw up not at the end. But in the rest of the world, people prefer screw up at the end, because I think it sounds better. <laughs> I think it makes more sense. So I told the publisher, I win. <laughs> because we're trying to optimize sales globally and not just in the US. And by the way, I sell more books in Europe than in North America. So there you go. Well, it's the first time I want to fight with the publisher, I can tell you that. It doesn't happen very often. But the interesting thing is, no matter where the feedback came from, lots of people asked me questions about the color pink. Is this going to be a ladies' book? <laughs> what? I like this color. The designer came up with it and said, oh, this just jumps out at me. I love it. Oh, and some people said, I thought it was going to, oh, I thought it was a girl's book. 
And this was both men and women. I kid you not, both had this same feedback. So I said, OK, let's make the book white. Because I'm not going to have conversations the rest of my life about the girl book that I wrote in, in 2019. That's not what I'm looking forward to. Though I kept the color pink around my name, as you can see. <laughs> That's a very important thing that I achieved. There's a little bit of territory that I claimed. I like the, the, I like the pink, and the rest can have white, for all I care. Now, this is a split test, right? This is an A-B test. This is the typical thing that you should be doing all the time with your ideas. What is the feedback that you get right, on, on your ideas? And where does that sit? Well, typically in Sensitize, of course, in the testing part, you have an hypothesis, you create something, and then you test that, that stuff. Last example, and then I'm going to wrap it up. We're going to solve the innovative dilemma by combining these two, uh, two models. So journey mapping is another popular exercise that I also did with my team. It basically, it shows you the, 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 the journey of a user, of a customer, with your product or service. You, you create a picture of it, and then you find the wow moments and the what the F moments along the way. Right? And of course, you want the wow moments as soon as possible. Then people say, oh, this is absolutely amazing. Usually, people experience more what the F moments with your product or service, and you need to know about, about that. To give an actual example, as I said, I like coffee. So I find coffee through Google Maps by sorting by distance and highest rated and, and open now. I just filter and then I walk for 20, 25 minutes in a strange city, wonderful weather perhaps, and nice walk, and then I get to the coffee bar and it is not there. <sighs> That's the first what the F moment, okay? The people, the people of the coffee bar do not realize that Google Maps is my first touch point with their business. The data should be accurate. It's not that hard to just make sure that the data is correct of your coffee bar. So I will go somewhere else then. I'll go to the next one. Uh, Ten minutes, please, because now I really need my coffee. I go there, close for the holidays. Ah. Oh. Next what the F moments, okay. Next one, five minutes, Starbucks, anything is fine. I need a coffee. <laughs> okay, so I come at a coffee bar. It is open, it has nice chairs, there seems to be Wi-Fi, there are people working with computers. Ooh, that looks good, I can be here for two hours. So I order my cafe latte and I get a latte macchiato. Ah, a new what the F moment. Now, for those who do not know anything about coffee, this is very, very important, OK? So here we go. Over there, we have the latte macchiato. It is an Italian invention. It usually comes in a glass, and it is hot milk first. And then you throw in the espresso. It literally means stained milk, milk with the stain of the espresso thrown in, right? And this is how Italians teach babies how to drink Coffee, basically. <laughs> True, it's a, it's, a breakfast, it's a breakfast drink in, in, in Italy. And on the other hand, we have the cafe latte, which is an American idea. It emerged in California. And it is because the Americans thought the cappuccinos, as the Italians made them, were a bit too strong. So they made the cups bigger and just threw in more milk. And they made it the cafe latte, the milky coffee. That's the kind of coffee that you can make latte art with because the milk comes last, right? You cannot make latte art with latte macchiato. It makes no sense because the espresso comes last. So this is how Italians taught Americans how to drink coffee. Right? Now, the problem is the cafe latte has been imported in Europe, and it's a big mess over there in my continent. And I see the latte macchiato coming here, and I'm warning you guys already, okay, that this is an important distinction. So uh, uh, the barista, the, I, I order cafe latte, he gives me a latte macchiato, and he says, that's not a cafe latte. That's a latte macchiato. And he says, that's the same thing. <laughs> then I said, well, if that's the same thing, then a barista is the same as a plumber. Because <laughs> you obviously don't care about the order of the fluids in the cup, right? <laughs> so here we go, the last takeaway. At the count of three. <laughs> One, two, three. Coffee with milk is not milk with coffee. Thank you so much. This is 
so important. All right, finishing up. The innovation vortex, the journey mapping that I showed you, finding the wow moments and the what the F moments is crucial. Of course, that's sensitizing, but also systematizing. Basically, it, it covered a lot of streams in the whole innovation vortex, all of design thinking and lean startup combined. And I actually turned that into an assessment test uh, that you can do with your own team. You just paint the picture of the whole vortex. You give yourself three points if you did something in each of those seven streams, and two points if you did something in the, uh, in the, in the last month, and one point if you did something in the last quarter. Just a bit of gamification. Makes it fun, but it confronts you with the fact that at least you should be doing something with empathizing and hypothesizing and sensitizing, and et cetera. All over the vortex, you need to be with your team, uh, preferably as often as possible. Last wise words from Robert Cooper, who created, who invented the stage gate model. The first thing to remember is, is it's a bit like playing poker. Uh, when you sit down at the poker table and you start betting, you don't put all your money on the table. You put maybe two dollars or two euros, and you get a few cards. And then you bet a little bit more money, and you, and you get a few more cards and, and more information. In other words, New product projects, you never bet all the money at the beginning. It's a stepwise process. It's an incremental commitment. As you learn more, you bet more. It's an incremental commitment. It's a step-by-step -step process. As you learn more, you bet more. That's how the whole investment world works in the startup scene, right? Based on actual evidence, you get bigger budgets. And not based on just a CV or an idea, you get a huge budget to build an entire product. No, show me the evidence, like an X Factor. Just go on stage and show us what you can do, and if it's any good, you might go to the next stage. And we remove everyone who doesn't even know how to sing. So that's the innovation funnel across life cycle stages. That's part one of the solution of the innovator's dilemma. And in the beginning, we find the kids, the new ideas, the disruptive innovation. They can do anything. They can be as wacky and weird as they, as they can, because that's the whole point of being a kid, to learn all the time, all day long. But the older they get, the more they will have to execute. And then they switch to execution, basically, and then they still have to learn. You still have to innovate, only the kind of innovation changes from disruptive to sustaining. You're just executing a business model, but you're still improving. They did make CDs better over time after the disruptive innovation of having invented it in the first place. And you see the vortex, it, it rotates from the very first days. You have to do all that stuff, empathizing, hypothesizing, sensitizing, et cetera, et cetera. But then the further you get, the bigger the wheel gets, the bigger the vortex. It will rotate more slowly, probably. It takes more time to run just a simple test with a product or service that is actually working. You need to have all those TDD tests in place, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure nothing breaks down, all that. Those are the rules for the adults. The kids don't have those rules. They have other rules to, to live by. And you know what? Nature has already solved this problem millions of years ago. They call it species versus organisms. Same with organizations versus products and services. Species virtually could live forever by having Organisms start up, screw, uh, scale up, and screw up in an endless cycle all the time. And the young ones always play, and the adults, they earn all the money, and they pay for the kids and maybe also the senior citizens. Uh, and that is what a family is, uh, is supposed to be. So the only way not to dis be disrupted is to disrupt yourself. So in other words, go forth and make more babies. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, there are copies of the Startup Scale-Up Screw-Up book around. I uh, happily autographed some, uh, some books, and I will keep doing that uh, later uh, in the hallway or somewhere. Just find me. I'll happily sign, uh, sign a copy of, uh, of the book for you. So thank you so much. And uh, back to the, uh, to the organizers, I suppose. Yeah.